There's nothing in the world like the Word of God. It's powerful, and it is useful. Listen, open your hearts, give your full attention. In verse 1, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. When the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Thus far, the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to attend the word of God with prayer, as we always do. So let's pray together. Lord, we read and hear aloud, God, the institution of the Passover meal, God, for Israel, of these Old Testament observances. And God, we already see and God, we, we feel the tremors and echoes of the gospel of the New Testament. God, how you show great salvation and favor to those who trust in you for mercy. Lord God, as we hear your word today, God, we ask for a couple things. Lord, we ask, one, that you would fill your speaker, you'd fill me with the Holy Spirit, Lord, that the word might come clearly and God accurately so that there would be minimal human interference with the message you would give to your church today. That, Lord, you would empower the word but Father, also that you would empower our hearing. God, that you'd be in each of us. For the Holy Spirit is not just for the preacher. The Holy Spirit is for each of the congregation members. Lord, and as Christ promised us, he will glorify the Son. God, he will lead us into the truth. And God, we ask for that to occur today in the hearing of the preaching of your word. Father, we're here in body. God, would you make us here present in both body and soul. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're reading from this passage in Exodus, and some of you guys may be thinking, how is Passover one of the themes of the Bible? It seems like the gospel certainly is, but a celebratory meal uh, doesn't seem like it's uh, really that big of a deal. Uh, it might surprise you, you know, as you read through the Bible, that one of the most uh, recurring commands that God gives is that of remembrance, uh, that his people, Christians and you know, the Old Testament saints, would remember and not forget the grace and the works of God. That's one of the reasons why, you know, punctuated all throughout major events in Israel's history, you see them put up monuments and landmarks and statues and all kinds of things that sort of mark occasions. They don't just mark borders from one area to the next, but they're set up oftentimes as remembrance sort of icons, things to spark their memory as to events of God's faithfulness and justice and mercy in their past. And the reason why I think you, you can kind of get this in your own life is because Israel was prone to forget. They forgot often, right? Forgetting the grace of God, forgetting his mercy, forgetting the deliverance and salvation. So one of the reasons why they kept turning to idols is because the love of God felt after time 
rather irrelevant and cold in history. It doesn't seem relevant day to day, oftentimes. And so God institutes for them multiple sort of things and occasions and festivals and days to remember. Simply that, to remember. In fact, Claire Davis, a church historian, describes Christian life this way. It's a combination of amnesia and deja vu. It's amnesia and deja vu because on one end, Christians forget all the time the grace of God. We live almost as if we've forgotten that he saved us, that we have eternal life, that we're rescued from sin, and there's tremendous goodness in the church and in his grace to us. We just forget. And at the same time, there are just punctuated times where we remember. There's like deja vu. Oh, that's right. God is good. I totally forgot God does save. It's almost like it's the days that baptisms occur and the days that you see members come. It's like, oh, I forgot the church is a thing, that he actually is doing gracious work still. How did I forget this? And, uh, and in Christian life, you can almost describe it this way. I know I've forgotten this before. Like, I know I've forgotten that at least more than once. Like, that's right. He is that, that God, and I am his, I am his redeemed saint. Um, and this is, I think, the, the perpetual curse. You and I, at some point in life, hopefully all throughout our lives, we have these incredible stories of redemption, incredible stories of salvation, and we forget them. We get swamped by the day-to-day. We get busy with the things that happen just more urgently day by day. And here we see that in Israel's history, in the beginning of their real exodus event, that the central sort of practice that follows this, even before the commandments come to them, even before Mount Sinai occurs for them, is remember this salvation. Remember this deliverance. Do not forget the goodness of God to save you from the plague, from the death that was upon you and upon all Egypt. And what I want to show us today, if, if you sort of have a single point, some of you guys can't remember three points. You can remember maybe one point, like one big idea. Well, here's the big idea. God's people must remember the gospel. That's, that's the big idea where you're like, I zoned out for the rest. I tuned into football right afterwards. Well, here is the big thing, right? You have to, for the sake of your joy and well-being and faithfulness to God, you must remember the gospel. And you have to remember it, meaning consider back to not only what it pr- consists of, but what it meant to your life. And here's three ways I think the Passover shows us the remembrance of the gospels sort of can be structured, how you can remember it. Uh, the three items of the Passover meal, in fact, and, and we'll walk through what they are. The bitter herbs, the unleavened bread, and then the Pascal lamb or the Passover lamb. Those three things. The veggies, right? Uh, the bread, the carbs, and the meat, the protein. If you get all those three things down, you'll pretty much remember the gospel for us too. And, uh, and we want to do this as a regular practice. Now in Exodus, and you're just thinking, where is, where is this passage in Exodus sort of found? Uh, it's right in between the deliverance episodes of the 10 plagues, right? It's the pronouncement of the 10th plague to come. And then after that, it's rescue. They're freed. You know, remember the story, right? Prince of Egypt. Pharaoh chases them, right? And, and they go through the, the Red Sea. The waters close up around them. And then, you know, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer sings a song. And it's like joy and then, you know, salvation. Uh, but this is the night uh, right before the slaying of the firstborn. Do you guys remember the plagues? A lot of you guys remember a few of them, right? The, the most visual ones. Uh, if you didn't notice this, of the 10 plagues, the 10th is a special one. It's special not just because it takes human life and it's you know, more than a nuisance or a assault on the livestock or the welfare of the nation, but it's because it was pronounced over the people of God themselves. The promise that, that God had for the Israelites was twofold. One was deliverance, right? It was freedom and rescue. It was taking them out of Egypt. But the second was to make them God's people, to redeem them and to have a new ownership over them so that they'd be free to worship. Now, as God shows judgment over the gods of Egypt, all the plagues are related to kind of showing great authority over the ones that Egypt placed worship to, honor and and worship and veneration to, that God was sovereign over all of them. However, the 10th plague was different. Notice that the nine plagues were all mediated by Moses. Moses was kind of the the main face of all the plagues. He was permitted by God to kind of be the representative of God's judgment. 
The tenth plague, however, was different because God himself was the mediator of the plague. He himself would be there to do the slaying of the firstborn. That's part of the, the terrifying promise given here in the passage. Up until now, you've got to think, I mean, Moses met with God, the burning bush. He has these kind of episodes of meeting this holy God, of being in this sort of fearful encounter with him. But now God promises, I will myself come to Egypt. And it's not going to be this worshipful encounter of just bowing down and hearing from me in a burning bush. It's going to mean the slaying of sons. Now that's a great, a great sorrowful calamity upon anyone. But in a time and in a nation that practices, you know, the, the ancient practice of primogenitor, right? If you, if you know what that is, basically, you know, old school people, they say the firstborn child is like everything, right? We're going to put all the money into it, all the education, going to give all the, the finances and real estate and resources. We're going to make that firstborn basically the ruler of the family to not, to not diffuse our family's power and wealth and resources and energy. If we have 12 kids, Sorry, number 10 is just not going to be that big a deal, right? We got to pick one of them to be the success because that's all we got time for in a busy house, right? When we're farming and doing stuff. So the firstborn child, money's going to him, time, effort, training, blessings are going to him. So what happens when there's a threat to slay all the firstborn children? It's both practical and spiritual. Practically, to slay the firstborn child means it's massively disrupting the peace and prosperity of the people. Now, why is that? If you'll notice in ancient times, why were there so many sort of backstabbing killings and, you know, family feuds in the days of like ancient times? Well, it's because the line of succession made it so that it was peaceful. You knew who the firstborn was. That was the guy that would take the line and take the family's stuff. If you slay the firstborn, all of a sudden it's an inheritance struggle. Who's getting the cows? Who's getting the home? Who's getting the, you know, the sort of the family name? right? Who's getting all this stuff? And there'd be internal struggles. That's why in ancient times, when a successor was not clear, you'd often have murder, slander, betrayal, and even war. And yet Israel themselves are under threat here. In fact, some even theorize all Israel's individuals might've been under threat here because God has said in Exodus 4.22, then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. God has already claimed Israel that they're all my favored inheritors of my blessing and wealth and goodness and my protection and my name will be to them. Now, whether it's true that Israel representatively, right, as, as one kind of communal whole is God's firstborn, it at least shows us when God is thinking of, of judgment, right, what is going to happen when my wrath comes on a sinful people? He's thinking all his people are under threat of that because they're all his firstborn. Nobody is free from the threat of God's judgment. And so we know the story before we get to the remembrance side, but what happens? God's judgment will be upon all of them, both Egyptians and Israelites alike, and yet God gave a way of salvation for the Israelites who would believe. They would slay a lamb. They would take the blood and, and they would sort of get this brush you know, made of a branch and they would brush it over the, the doorpost of their home. And when the Spirit of God came in through the city, they would see that blood has already been spilled in this home. A substitute has been offered. And so there's no need to have two deaths in the house. And so the Spirit of God would pass and go to the next, and it would do this exhaustively, meticulously throughout the entire nation, and throughout the entire place of their, of their residing, and would slay the firstborn. Nobody would be exempt, not even God's own people, but for those who trusted in the mercy of God, in the way that he provided, in the slain lamb, when that is demonstrated over the doorpost, there would be salvation. Now, the whole Passover meal is not just sort of eating in, as a celebratory thing, right? It's a remembrance meal. It's a meal designed around having them think about that salvation episode regularly, year by year. Now, why? And let's jump into what, what it means then. First, the veggies. The, Worst part of a meal. I, I could say it's the worst part of a meal because biblically, this is the worst part of the meal, right? Why is that? Uh, notice in verse 8, they're commanded to chew on bitter herbs, right? Look at verse 8. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire. With what? With unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. That's 
That's kind of the first part. Now, what are these bitter herbs? We don't think about bitter herbs often. Uh, likely lettuce, endive, some other garnishes. Uh, we, we have bitter herbs today. A lot of you guys don't like them. You know, sesame, sesame leaf, cilantro, mint leaves, right? It's the kind of stuff that some people just hate. Some of the reasons why you guys don't like pico de gallo, right? Because cilantro is kind of a, a, what is it, acidic, bitter kind of you know, herbal taste. Now, what the Israelites were commanded to do is just chew on them. Just chew those bitter herbs. Just put that leaf in your mouth and chew it out. It doesn't seem like a very appetizing start to a meal, right? For some of you guys that are like, you know, like Asian wraps and all that, you're like, oh, that's awesome. I love wrapping things in, you know, herbs. Like, it's the best way to eat it. Uh, that's not the point here. The reason why they were to eat the bitter herbs is to remember the bitterness of their bondage. That's the point. The bitter herbs were a reminder that when you were in Egypt, that's what it was like. Bitter, tasteless, grinding, lifeless food. That's what salads are like to, to the Bible. Uh, is to remember their bondage to Egypt, to remember their bitter labors, the bitterness of it. It was awful back there. Why is that important? Do you remember when the Israelites started to get frustrated with what God was leading them through? It manifested in kind of this rose-colored remembrance of their, of their past. In Numbers, they complained to Moses. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. It's funny, right? Because, I mean, you can almost hear your kids complain this kind of way. It's like, yeah, I, I get that feeling. But the complaining heart of Israel was in many ways symbolic of the perpetual sin of God's people, which is to dramatically sort of create a highlight reel of your past of sin, thinking it was better than I remember. Man, it was great. It was wonderful. It had great pleasures, great liberties, great things in my past. And to diminish the grace of God to say, and it's just worthless manna. What does God give me? flavorless bread. That's my life when I trust God. That's my life when I follow God. It's just living day to day, not exciting. It's not flavorful. It's just manna. When you think, well, what is the manna? It's bread from heaven so that you would not die. It's the grace to be alive and freedom to worship. It's incredible, redemptive, loving blessing. But they don't see it that way. And so in that way, you see this pattern of sin in Israel that's a warning to us, right? The wandering of Israel was a warning to us as Christians today. What is it? That the perpetual sort of temptation of any Christian is to not only forget the greatness of God's grace, but it's to lift up and sort of to wash with sort of blessed colors the slavery of our past. And so they were called. So you know, every year when you take the Passover, chew on those bitter herbs and remember. Remember Egypt. Remember that it was not melons. It was not cucumbers and free fish. It was bitter herbs. That's what it was. And in many ways, like any kind of, I, I guess in some ways, appetizer like that, it prepares you for some kind of hunger and desire for the real meal. You know, if you eat something nasty, if you're on a diet, you realize that, you know, there's this saying, right? Hunger is the best spice. If you're hungry, even food that you once thought was just kind of ordinary becomes like just fantastic. Like if you're eating low carb, low sugar, low salt, low life, just life diet, whatever, and you have like a bag of chips, it's almost drug-like, right, in how good it is. Or if you've given up soda for a year and you drink like a Coke, I mean, I, I love whiskey and all that kind of stuff, but sometimes a Coke is like more powerful because there's something about not having it and having something much simpler for a long time that when you have the real, like the, the pleasing, abundant thing, man, there is joy. And in many ways, that's how God prepares us for the joy of grace. Remember how bondage really felt. And put it this way, 
This may not just be chronological in the Christian life. Some of you guys don't have a memory of a wild, reckless, sort of prodigal son time of your life. You don't remember those times. You were always raised up in church, always raised up as a Christian family. Well, here's sort of the idea. All of us have tasted and experimented, experimented with sin and wandering. None of you guys are perfectly sanctified. And we tend to remember sin in ways that are just false to reality. You know, we think about things like sex. We think about things like, you know, overindulgence in food and comforts. We think about sort of the glory of power or the safety of money. And we tend to think about them, even though God shows us time and time again, it's not what you think it is. It's, it's creating bondage in your life. You're not a free person because of those things. Your life is not good under them. Even though he shows that to us, just give it a little bit of time, you start looking back. I don't know if faith is really all that it's cracked up to be compared to money. At some point, all of us, haven't we, have had some realization, money is not the protector I thought it was. It's not the safety I had once hoped it was. But every single one of us falls back. We backslide back into that and say, you know what, though? Maybe this is stupid to be too, you know, cavalier about this. We think that way about all those habits we tend to kick as well. We think that once and for all, we got rid of a, a, a habit that is destructive to our life, like pornography or drinking or some other kind of thing that you know is obviously destructive. But then what we do is we just, our mind forgets grace and we sort of think about sin in ways that lift up its goodness even though it's been shown to be false. So here, here's that first question. When you think about, and I'm talking about the past life in terms of all the allure of sin and idolatry that is a part of that, what do you choose to remember about it? The pleasure? The feelings? The instant gratification? The Bible encourages us here to remember the shame. Remember the bondage. Remember the guilt. Remember the diminished prayer life. Remember the inability to worship and freedom. Remember those things. Is that worth going back to? The bitter herbs. But next comes the unleavened bread, the carbs. The unleavened bread uh, represents this. Remember the escape. Remember the mercy of God that delivered you, that freed you. Remember your escape from bondage. In verse 8, you notice there that the unleavened bread has some instructions to it, right? Uh, verse 8, he says, They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Now, the whole emphasis, right, of the, the coming passages, verse 11 on, is about speed. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Because as soon as the meal is done, be ready to go. Be ready to get gone. The freedom comes right after. As soon as God does judgment to your enemies, then go. Don't wait around. Now, unleavened bread, if, you know, it's not a word we use very often, but that basically means bread without yeast, right? It's like more like a cracker-like, matzah bread-like substance. Uh, it's you know, wraps, you know, pita bread and all that kind of fancy foods these days. Um, do you realize that uh, four times they're given instructions to not put yeast in their bread? Funny enough, I mean, I, I did some study on this. The Bible sort of forbids yeast even more often than homosexuality. <laughs> like, it really does not like yeast in bread for a lot of these observances. Now, why is that? Because it seems to have, it seems to have more of a meaning than just the speed at which you cook the bread, because bread takes a while to, to bake, apparently. Uh, why is that? Uh, both Jewish and Christian scholars note here that yeast in the scriptures are oftentimes synonymized with sin. That the effect of yeast, if you know how bread breaks, bread breaks, bread bakes, you set up a machine, whatever, right, and you pour some ingredients on the top of it, and it spins stuff around, and bread comes out, right? But the most important ingredient inside of bread is the yeast, Right? They come in little packets. They look like little dust things, right? That's how you make bread, I guess. And you pour the yeast into the spinner, and it does some magic, and bread comes out, right? But the way that yeast works, if you've ever seen this occur or know how bread works, the yeast, I guess, permeates the dough, and it has this infectious quality that it, it 
even though you put a little bit on the top, it goes throughout the whole lump and it expands it. And so the whole idea of yeast as a symbol in the Bible, you know, when Jesus talks about the yeast of the Pharisees or the leaven of the Pharisees, it's talking about its pervasive, permeating effect to start small and go throughout the whole thing. And the Bible likens yeast in many ways to sin, and that sin has the same kind of effect. It starts off with a little habit, starts off with a little lust, starts off with a little bit of idolatry, but it permeates the whole person until it really becomes all you are. And so as commentators and the scholars here note, the yeastless bread is in a larger way symbolic that God's people likewise would be an unleavened people an unmixed people, an uncontaminated people. Because the idolatry and the sin and the worship and religion of the surrounding nations would, like yeast, infect God's people and work itself throughout the entire nation. So the perpetual eating of unleavened bread is in some ways eating a pure thing, a holy thing. That God's people likewise would be a holy people, redeemed to be holy, and without the leaven of Egypt. It was a remembrance of God's demand that they be a holy people. That God, in fact, redeemed them to be holy. Bitter herbs, if you remember here, remembers their bondage to sin. The unleavened bread remembers here that God has rescued us to make us a holy people. Now finally, the main course, which is the lamb, and the Lamb calls us to remember our substitute and really to remember God who saves, to remember the substitute. Now, the Lamb has very many links here to Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus referred to as the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world, uh, the institution of the regular sacrifices of atonement for the people of God. The sacrifice of the Lamb was a huge part of Israel's practice every year. Now, what did it mean? The lamb was the most important part of the meal, just like meat is the most important part of any meal. Right? It is always the most important part of the meal. It's actually maybe all you need in a meal. And remember now the, the final plague. God would come and visit, Israel, visit Egypt, and they would kill a lamb and smear the blood over the doorposts of their homes. And all Israel did this. All Israel. In many ways, all Israel is God's firstborn as a nation. And God didn't pass over because he saw Israelites. Now, this is important, right? God didn't save his people just because he said, that's got Jewish blood, I'm going to pass over. It was irrelevant to God. What was relevant to God was blood. Blood was the marker. Blood was the sign. And so for that reason, the lamb represented the very salvation of God offered to them by his grace. God gave them a way to be saved. Because the lamb served as a substitute for the ones inside. That's really what the lamb was. Now, you got to think, a lamb was, a, in some ways, a, a smaller, less sort of important substitute, right? A lamb is not a firstborn child. I would rather give up 10 lambs than my son, Colin, right? And it was really funny. Is at one point, Colin asked me, he's like, why is it only the firstborn boys that died? What about the girls? I was like, sorry, son. It's, a, it's, it's, it's hard to be a son. But that's why you got like, to man up, son. It's time, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go, right? Um, and you got to think, a son's a, a very valuable, precious thing to a family, not just because he's a son, but because, again, all the, the benefits I'd pass on to the son for the sake of longevity and dynasty for the family and all that kind of stuff. But a lamb is, is in some ways a, a smaller substitute, right? But this is so that Israel could look forward to 1,400 years later when God would provide a substitute sufficient to actually take away the sins of his people. Now, a lamb might represent death, right? There is blood. Whether it's human blood or lamb's blood, there would be blood on the house. So death has happened. But this is a shadow of what was to come in Christ, who Christ is our great substitute, who... Uh, John describes as a propitiation for our sins, an object that satisfies the wrath of God. That's what Jesus is. He is the lamb, perfect and unblemished. And Israel is to remember, in fact, the nature of salvation, that there was a substitute provided for them. The lamb, in fact, this is what's crazy. The lamb was not just the object of sacrifice. It became the object of their feast. It became the source of celebration. It became what they ate. They ate. 
Not only did they slay it and then sort of burn up the carcass, but meat in those days was a special occasion. You didn't eat meat unless it was a party. You wouldn't usually just cut and kill a lamb just for like a family dinner, right? For the most part, they didn't have refrigeration. The times where you tend to kill calves and, and slaughter and kill meat is when it's time for a bunch of people to get together for a special occasion because you had to eat it all at once. You couldn't preserve it very well, right? So what does that mean? It was a party. This is a special time when Old Testament people can sit around a fire and eat grilled meat. There's something physically that rejoices, the fact that you're just getting protein and nourishment. And there's joy because meat tastes good. The Bible affirms that meat is like a blessed food, right? It's good food. And so the lamb became the occasion, not just of salvation, but of joy and of fellowship. And that's what the church in many ways does in Christ. That's why at the Lord's Supper, when we celebrate, it's not just remembering our salvation, it's joyfully celebrating our salvation by the death of Christ. Now, notice here three things about the lamb that also apply to Jesus. There are three main commands concerning the Pascal lamb. One is that it would be perfect. It must be a perfect, unblemished lamb. Second is that it would be sufficient, that there would be enough to feed everybody. Okay? Third is that it would not be wasted, that there would not be leftovers. Now, wh why does that matter? Follow with me here. First, the uh, perfection of the lamb. The Bible tells us the command here is unblemished. It needs to be perfect, flawless. It can't be some janky whatever lamb. It has to be a perfect lamb. The best you can provide. Secondly, that it be sufficient. The command was one for each household, meaning no child, no adult gets left out. Everybody gets meat that day. Everybody takes that meal together. If there's not enough, if you're poor, go to a neighbor's house and share. But there needs to be enough for everybody. Third, that there be no leftovers. They were commanded to burn the leftovers. Now, if you're on a, getting ready for a journey and you just cooked up a meal, just think, in your mind, you're like, dude, let's just pack up some of this and have some sandwiches for the road, right? That's a smart thing to do. But he says, no, you're not allowed to share this after. It's for the night only. They were to have just enough for one meal. Now, this foreshadows for us a deep existing reality about Christ, who is our lamb. Number one, he is our perfect substitute. His death satisfies the wrath of God, for we deserve judgment for our sins. We have... We have sinned against an infinitely holy God and deserve infinite, unending, perfect punishment. And Christ, who is our way of escape, when God sees his death for us, then we also have fullness of joy and fellowship. But notice also, our substitute is perfect, without blemish. He's also sufficient for all his people. And in fact, the final and perhaps surprising point, and there are no leftovers of Christ's grace. There's no overflow past the time of salvation. Consider this. Christ was tempted, though without sin, perfectly submissive to the Father, obedient even to the point of death, and the Father delights in him. God looks at Christ as the perfect, unblemished lamb. In a lot of ways, our faith hinges on his perfection. If you have any doubt as to God's satisfaction with Christ in his life and his obedience, both in life and in death, then you doubt the very nature of salvation itself because what if God's not satisfied? His perfection is, in many ways, a balance to your imperfection. That's how it works because Christ is the unblemished lamb of God that God himself provided. You think, when Israel offers their best lamb, I, don't, I would have a lot of doubt. What about that mole? This is the best we have, but shoot, if it's going to mean death, I don't know if I feel comfortable that this is the best I can offer, but when God himself provides his perfect lamb, how can there be any fear? And Christ demonstrated himself to be without blemish. Secondly, our substitute is sufficient. There is nothing lacking in him to fulfill all of our deepest needs, wants, and delights. He's truly enough. Now, I say that because in many ways, you all hear, you know, every week, the gospel and Christ offered to us in his death and resurrection should be sufficient to make all of us happy and joyful, shouldn't it? More than any sin, more than any other idol, 
It should be a cause for celebration when we remember Christ and his work and his life, his sufficiency for us. And what God is sort of showing to the Israelites and showing to us, God is not lacking in the ability to grant joy from the things that he provides. Right? You got to know that God is a God who, in many ways, parties. He parties harder, harder, harder than us, right? Because what he can provide in joy is greater than what we can provide for ourselves. In that way, Christ also, as he is offered to us, fulfills all of our deepest needs and desires. We have to remember that. In many ways, as we feast on Christ by faith, satisfaction is the end. Satisfaction is, is the goal. He's truly enough. And finally, and this is, I think, a warning to us, he's given in limitation. There are no leftovers of Christ. It was exact in its sufficiency, and there was to be no waste. Remember, if you have something left over, there's no Passover lamb past Passover night. You guys get the idea there? If you miss the Passover event, of the blood on the doorpost and the Passover meal, there was not breakfast leftovers for those who slept on it, who waited on it. The whole idea was salvation is a limited time act of faith. If you missed it, there's nothing left for you. The people are gone. The judgment's already there upon you. And in the same way, the atonement of Christ achieves for the elect what we would describe you know, Calvinistically as what limited atonement is for the elect only. There is no salvation outside of Christ. There is no second chances after judgment. There's no extra Passover for those who skip it. And you know what that means is for those of us listening to the gospel, we were kind of sitting on the fence about it. The meal is offered now because the Passover event itself is offered before the judgment. But once that judgment comes, there are no leftovers. There are no leftovers of grace. It's a one-time ticket to the feast. Motyer, uh, who's a late and great um, commentator on this passage, says this. This means that the sole purpose and use of the lamb was to provide Passover cover and Passover nourishment for the people whose number and needs it matched. And once that had been achieved, it was not available for anyone or anything else. It was chosen precisely for the people, and having met their needs, had no other purpose or function, so nothing of it was to remain once the meal was over. It's a one-time meal for God's people. Now, the wonder of the New Testament gospel is this. Everybody's invited to that Passover meal. Everyone's invited to that Passover event and salvation, but not forever, not everlastingly. Not always. Christ is perfect, sufficient, but he's limited in the offer given. It's not a forever offer. Now let me just make a quick application here. Um, the whole highlight of the Passover meal, and I think the whole remembrance of, our, of the gospel for the Christian life, is about Jesus and not necessarily about what you do with Jesus. Right? The whole emphasis, I think, is look at the great wonder and grace and mercy of God. Make that a, a constant reminder. I think for a lot of us, we oftentimes so quickly jump to the response we ought to have in faith. Am I living the right life? Am I responding in the correct kind of way? Do I have strong enough belief? We so quickly sort of internalize our responsibility with gospel, which is important, that we forget that the basic gospel itself is highlighting the grace of God, the greatness of God and his justice and his mercy, that God is to be the object of glory in the gospel, not necessarily our response or activity based upon it, though that certainly follows. And, and D.A. Carson, in a short clip I, I heard him preach about once, said it this way. Imagine on that Passover night, right? I'm, I'm just stealing his example here, so, you know, it's just research. <laughs> but he said, imagine on that night you have two Jews, right? And they're standing outside their, their house. And one of the Jews has great faith, Right? And he says, certainly God shall pass over. His word stands, and God is not a liar, and he saves those who trust in him. And, and he just has perfect faith, great and strong faith. And the second Jew says, man, I don't know. A lot of crazy things have been happening, and you know, I, I, I have not known this Yahweh that Moses has preached to us. And it's, just, it's a terrifying thing to be under judgment in the land of Egypt. I don't know about the idols I have. I don't know about the 
I don't know if I believe he's going to do that. And Carson would say, and then both of them take the blood in the bowl, they take the, the lentil brush, they, they post it up, and they go inside their homes and wait. And he asks this question, which of them will be saved? Now the answer to us, I think, is obvious. Both of them, right? The one with weak, flailing faith and the one with strong, confident faith that both would be saved because both have depended on the blood of the lamb and not necessarily the strength of their faith. That it's the blood that causes God to pass over in mercy. Not the character and attributes of the ones inside the home. He would look at the blood. And I think the same is true in many ways for us as Christians. A lot of us are questioning, do I have strong enough faith to be saved? And I want to comfort you and lead you to Jesus to say, look, if the blood of Christ is on you, if Jesus' blood is your only hope in life and death, to see God outside of judgment, but in mercy and in love and acceptance, you are saved whether you have weak faith or strong. For Christ is the one who saves not necessarily even just your confidence. Now what that does, I think, to us is this, though. It makes us flee to Jesus and not to our own will, not to our own ability. In fact, if you're sitting there thinking, but I still want stronger faith, pray for it. Holy Spirit with you, say, Holy Spirit, give me this faith that saves. You know, you can ask that. Avail yourselves of the ordinary means of grace. Word, sacrament, prayer, worship. In fact, here's just a couple of very practical points. This was a yearly remembrance, especially held in households. And in fact, children were to learn of the redemption of their parents. Kids never had this experience, but their parents did. And so what were they to do? The parents were to pass on their grace experience to their children. It's a very important part of not just passing on faith to the next generation, but in fact of evangelism. This is the great mercy and grace of God. If they had great reason because of the exodus to remember God's love and mercy, then how much more are we who see the reality behind the symbol? We pass that on to our children. That means, parents, there's a broad evangelistic ministry that we do that's concentrated on more than just speaking the gospel to people outside the church, but to speaking that faith and gospel to our children, meaning spending time praying with them, engaging them in conversation, Right? as church members, to welcome the children in our midst and to guide them in not just godliness, but to share the very good goodness of God to you. But you know, that's more than just for people with children. I know you guys think about children often. I consider all of you guys without spouses as kind of like, you know, in some ways, not like adult level, but in some ways as familyless sojourners in Buffalo. Because for a lot of you guys, you have no family here and you attach yourself to other people's family. I feel like it's embarrassing to say, but praise God that we can do that. You know, the wonderful thing about this passage, if you had no family to have Passover with, you go find a family and go eat it with them. Nobody does Passover alone, right? You celebrate with God's people as part of the, the inside. And in many ways, church, we've got to be open to that too. Meaning families, you've got to kind of open up in some ways to allow strangers into your home who need families too. And in Buffalo, more than almost any other place for our kind of congregation. And for singles, you've got to fight that sort of internal discomfort of attaching yourselves to existing family structures and just go do it for the grace of God. Go be a part of a family. In fact, the reality is the bigger our church gets, we're not going to just be one big family. We're going to be clusters of families. And you've got to be a part of one. You've got to have groups inside by which you celebrate the gospel. And lastly, the gospel needs to not only be in your hard drive memory, it needs to be in your RAM memory. Uh, and what I mean by that is all of us have the gospel in hard drive. It's in a file stored somewhere. We could recite it if someone asks us what is the gospel. We could bring it back up, right? But the gospel needs to be in our random access memory, meaning flowing in the front, just quickly accessible there constantly. Do you guys know the difference? Do you guys know who know computers? Like when you have an old computer with a disk and it's like bring up that file and it's like eh, 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 and like it spins and it's slow and it takes a while to get there. It's not really active inside the life of the computer. But random access stuff or like solid state stuff, it's just boom, it's there. It's immediately accessible. It's happening all the time. And the encouragement I want to give to you guys is Sunday is hard drive worship for some of you guys. It's just coming up when you pull up the file. But the gospel needs to be something that's just 
operating all the time in the background, working, never shut off, never closed, meaning you should be reading about it, you should be thinking about it. In fact, regularly, even as we do here, celebrating the Lord's Supper with reverence and joy, for that's our Passover meal here and now, and consider our great Passover. This is the end. What do we share together when we take the Lord's Supper? Because this is our Passover, right? This is our ongoing sacramental reminder of the grace of God. What do we eat? Bread and wine. Bread and wine. Now, why do we do that? I want to just point out one thing. Where are the veggies on the Lord's table? Yet again, nowhere to be found. No veggies when it comes to eating the greatest meal that God can provide to the believer. Why is that? Why is that? Because the bitterness is gone, right? The bitterness is gone. Do you know why that is? Because the bitterness has been tasted by Christ on the cross for us. Now, I realize bitterness has to do with also, you know, that that life of bondage, and we remember that life of bondage negatively. But you remember, do you know what the the taste inside Jesus' mouth was while he was being crucified? What he was tasting on that cross, literally, sour, bitter wine. It was representative of his own suffering and of the suffering that belonged to his people, the bitter wine that his people made to drink, the cup of God's wrath. So that when he provides a remembrance meal for his people, bread and wine are a joyful meal, satisfying and joy-giving. And that's because Christ himself, in his death, Tasted no bread, tasted no sweet wine. He tasted bitterness. Because he is our perfect substitute who, like us, as one of us, experienced the full wrath of God. This is the great hope of the Christian church. Uh, In this time, it may feel like manna. It may feel complain-worthy. But the grace of God is leading us on and on into that great promised land in his presence freedom to worship, freedom from bondage. Now here and now, remember your bondage. Remember the sin and the great shame and evil of that time. Remember, remember the salvation that came to us so quickly and so suddenly that we were to leave with unleavened bread. And then finally, remember our substitute, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Remember the one who takes away our sins by receiving himself, the punishment himself. He is worthy to be remembered. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray to you now, and God, we remember the gospel. Father, for we remember our sins, and not only the punishment which it deserves, but God, even it's, God, it's dehumanizing slavery God, remember how you saved us and how you lead us on still, providing for us day by day. And Father, remember Jesus, who is our perfect substitute, who is a lamb without blemish, but even more than a lamb, your own son, and God, the son of man. Thank you, Lord, for such a wonderful story. God, may it not only be a remembrance for us, but God, may it be a proclamation to the world as we remember him. God, we give you thanks for this, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.